Take your copy of the scripture and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10. You know, even when they cry, I love, I love this part. I really do. It is a joy. Well, everything in baseball is predicated on precision and predictability. You know, when you talk about somebody who's maybe a 260 hitter, they may have a season where they hit a little better than that, and they may have a season when they hit a little worse than that, but they're going to be a 260 hitter. It's predictable. That's what they are. Uh, you know, hurlers, when, they, when they're pitching the ball, they try to put a little bit of spin on it to get the ball to break left or break right, uh, pitching sliders or sinkers, whatever they can do. But, you know, there's one notable exception to the predictability of baseball. It's the knuckleball. And if you've watched baseball for very long, you know that knuckleball is pretty crazy. You see, when you throw that knuckleball, the ball itself doesn't spin. It just floats in over the plate. Charlie Hoff was one of the great knuckleballers in, in the history of baseball, and this is what he said about it. He said, the wind currents make the ball bob around like a wiffle ball, and it might break two or three different times on the way to the plate. That's what happens with those knuckleballers. So as a result, the pitcher and the catcher, let alone the hitter, have no idea where that ball is going to end up when it's thrown. Now, the knuckleball throws a hitter's hitting instincts off kilter, especially for big uh, sluggers who take big swings at the plate. Many years ago, the Yankee outfielder Bobby Mercer said that the challenge of hitting a knuckleball was like trying to eat jello with chopsticks. <laughs> Mickey Mantle, another great Yankee, said, Knuckleballers, I hate them all. And then, as far as catching a knuckleball, Joe Torrey said, Catchers need to use a big glove and a pair of rosary beads. Now, I, I, I caught when I played baseball, and I, the guy that I caught most often was a knuckleballer, too, even in high schooler. And he, that's exactly right. If I called that pitch, Lord, help me catch it. That's all I could say. You know, sometimes we think of God's will kind of like trying to hit a knuckleball. We don't know where it's going. We, we're trying to figure out where God's will is. And so what ends up happening is we become paralyzed at the plate. We just stand there because we don't know where it's going to go. And, and because of that, we don't even take a swing because we're often afraid to miss. And so we just stand there and let the opportunities pass by. Well, this morning as we continue our study of the model prayer we're going to consider the third petition here about God's will and it being done. And I want us to take a moment to think about what it means by that term, God's will. And then I want to see that we should have a desire in its fulfillment, both throughout the earth and in our own lives. So this morning, we're going to read the entire prayer. And I'd like you to join in reading that with me. So we stand in the honor of the reading of God's word. And we're going to read this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, thank you so much for providing this to us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this model prayer that teaches us how we should pray. Father, I pray this morning as we study this in a little more depth that we see the truth about your will and see how we are to pursue it, how we are to desire it, not only for the world, but for ourselves as well. We ask this in your precious son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You know, the term, the will of God, is perhaps one of the most confusing statements in all of Christian jargon. We, and the reason for that is this. We use this term at least three different ways. There are at least three different ways we talk about the will of God. First of all, if we want to talk about everything that happens in the world and the way that it happens, we talk about things going according to the will of God, don't we? And, and that's, that's true. And, and then sometimes 
We talk about the things that God has commanded us to do, right? Uh, all of his commandments, and we say that we need to do the will of God. Okay, well, but that's very different from the first one, isn't it? And then third, we talk about trying to find the will of God for our individual personal lives. And so there's three different ways. These are three distinct definitions. And depending upon who you're speaking to or what you're speaking about, somebody may talk about the will of God and they may be meaning one or, or maybe even a couple of those different definitions, but you may be meaning a different one. And there's some confusion that takes place. And so, so often we struggle with what the will of God means. We, 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 we're like that batter at the plate, thinking that the will of God is a knuckleball that he throws to us, that we have trouble discerning. Well, when we look at Scripture, I think we see two of those three definitions clearly set forth. I'm not so sure about the third one. So I want us to understand how the Bible talks about God's will, because if we can understand that better, we can avoid that confusion and the inaction and the frustration that so often characterizes people who are struggling to find God's will. So first of all, there's what we might call God's will of decree or his hidden will. Now, this is what God has ordained to happen. All that God has ordained to come to pass. You see, everything that God has ordained to happen will happen. There is nothing that can thwart the will of God. It is not as if God is in heaven on his throne saying, I intended for this person to be in that political office at this time, and those people messed it up. It's not the way it works. You see, it is God who establishes kings, and it is God who removes kings. It's God who raises up nations. It's God who lowers nations. God is the one who ordains and decrees everything in history to happen. It moves according to his will. That's why we refer to this as his hidden will. Because he didn't give us the specifics on how everything was going to play out. You can search scripture all you want, but it's not going to tell you whether Donald Trump is going to win a second term in 2020. Now, that may be what you want, or it may be what you don't want. You don't know, because that's in the future, right? That's part of his hidden will. But let me assure you of this. The person that God has ordained to be president of the United States in 2020 will be president of the United States in 2020. There's nothing that's going to thwart that, okay? Not any vote, not anything like that. But, you know, historians, boy, when we talk about this, we love to get off in the weeds sometimes. Have you ever had somebody say, yeah, well, what if, what if this decision had been made in the past differently? Uh, what if Hitler had actually sold some artwork and became an artist and not a crazy dictator. Well, that's what historians call counterfactuals, and they love to work through those. But those questions are all moot. They, they may be fun thought exercises. They may be fun to talk about with your friends over, over dinner or something like that. But really, it doesn't matter because God, in his perfect will, works all things together, both good and bad, for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Think about this. Consider the most heinous act that has ever occurred in all history, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now, some of you may be saying, no, wait a minute, Pastor. Crucifixion of one man is worse than the Holocaust? Yes. And I'll tell you why. Because Jesus is the only innocent person who has ever lived. He is the only person who has been without sin. Perfect. And for him to go through a kangaroo court, a show trial where the 
outcome was already determined. To be tortured and abused as he was when he was scourged. And then to be crucified, the most horrible execution that has ever been devised in the mind of man. Yes, that is the most heinous act. And do you know what? Scripture says it was all according to God's will of decree. Acts 4, 27 and 28 says, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. As hard as it may be for us to accept, Jesus' crucifixion was always God's plan. It was his plan before the foundation of the earth. It was not plan B. It's not as if when Adam and Eve sinned that God said, what am I going to do now? Well, Jesus, I'm sorry. You're going to have to go and, and pay the penalty for them. I, that wasn't my plan, but you're going to have to clean up their mess now. No, that was always his plan. Always his plan for his glory. In fact, God doesn't have a plan B at all. There is no plan B in God's will. There is only his plan. But second, not only is there a will of decree, there is a will of desire. This is what we might call his revealed will. This is what God has told us he finds pleasing. In other words, it's what he expects of us. It's what he wants us to do. It's, it's the moral law that he has revealed to us in the pages of Scripture. Now, it doesn't take hours of Bible study to figure out what God expects of us. You can actually sum it up as, as Micah did in Micah 6.8. He says, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Now, at this point, some of you may be going, now, wait a minute, Pastor. I get this. I, I can get the will of decree. God has ordained things to happen. They happen. He, he's guiding history. And, and I can get the will of desire that he wants us to do things. And I see that we can disobey them, Right? He's told us to live according to this way, and, and we don't. How does that work together? How can I be held responsible if I do what God's already decreed I'm going to do? That doesn't seem fair, does it? Well, you know what? Paul anticipated this question in Romans 9. And, and I want to put this up here. It's a little bit longer of a passage, so I'm going to put it up here on the screen. Paul says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles." You see, God has, has worked according to his will. And I'm going to stand here before you, brothers and sisters, and I'm not even going to pretend to understand exactly how God's will of decree and God's will of desire work. But I am going to tell you that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches it very clearly. God's will, his will of decree, 
Everything is going to happen exactly as he says it happens, and he has a will of desire. He gives us the opportunity to obey or disobey. Before you today are two paths, right? Just as, as Joshua said, you have two paths you can go down. This is what we have before us. In fact, there is a passage of Scripture, I think, that shows both aspects of God's will side by side. It's Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Why? That we may do all the words of this law. You see, there are hidden things that are belong to God and God alone. And then there are the things he's revealed to us. And those are the things that we follow. So we have two aspects of God's will. So what about, what about a hidden personal plan that God has for each of us? A will of direction, we might call. Well, if we're frank, this is what we usually mean when we talk about the will of God, isn't it? We, we talk about the will of God in our life, and we're talking about a specific plan for us. And we believe that God has a plan for us, don't we? Good, because he does. Nothing in what I've said so far goes against that. But what we have done is we've turned trying to find the will of God into this idea of this hidden personal plan, and we search after it, we're ignoring all of the other things that he has already revealed to us. And the result is inaction, it's frustration, it's discouragement, because we are essentially trying to seek his hidden will as it relates to our individual life. And, and that's not what Scripture says. So we worry all the time that we're going to choose the wrong school. We're going to choose the wrong spouse. We're going to choose the wrong career or the wrong house. And as a result, we end up with a life that God did not intend for us. And when we do that, we, we talk about being out of God's will. We use that terminology a lot. Well, listen, you can be out of God's will. There is no doubt about it. But what we're talking about is being out of his revealed will. You can be out of sync living as God has called us to live. You can be disobedient to God's word. That's being out of his will. Listen, you're not going to marry the wrong spouse. I know some of you think, oh, well, I have a soulmate. I have that one person in all the world that God made for me. Show me where that is in Scripture, please. You won't find it, but may I show you where it is? Read Plato. That's Greek philosophy, folks. The idea of a soulmate, one person made for you that you have to find and, and, and get together, that is Greek philosophy, pagan philosophy. It is not scriptural by any stretch. No, we cannot slip out of his decreed will. It's, we just can't do it. So rather than worry about whether we've got God's hidden will figured out, let's focus on what he's already shown us. Because he's, given, he's revealed enough of his will for us that we'll have plenty of time to worry about that without trying to figure out all of those hidden things that, that he has kept hidden for, from us for a reason. Let's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and trust that all those other things will be added to us. That's God's will of direction for our lives. So, with that better understanding of what is meant by God's will, what does it mean to pray that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven? When we bring this petition to the throne of God, we're asking that his will be done in both decree and desire. We're saying that we desire his perfect ordained plan to continue unfolding in the history of the world. And the people come into obedience with it. But we also are praying that in our individual lives that we are submitting and being conformed more and more to the image of Christ. That we might see that glorious work of sanctification completed in us. So first, let's, let's consider that first aspect, God's will on earth. When we pray for God's will to be done, we're essentially praying a prayer of the present, the here and now. Okay, we're asking for God's will to be done now. When Jesus taught his disciples, he was often telling them about how he wanted to see his father's will done now 
Listen, this is what Jesus said. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And he also said, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Do you understand? He said, this is present tense. Jesus is talking in present tense here. He's not talking about something way off in the future. Though. Okay, God's will will be done later. He's saying, I came to do God's will now. And that's what we pray for when we say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus knew the will of God. He pursued the will of God. He prayed for the will of God. And so such a prayer is asking that God, uh, on one part, that God is going to bring his salvation. Isn't that God's will? To save his people, to draw his people to himself, to go out looking after the lost sheep? That's what Jesus does. That's what God the Father is doing. We see that here. When you look at the redemptive history that we see all throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, it runs like a scarlet thread from the beginning to the end. When you look at that, you see his will for salvation of his people by his mighty hand through his Son. And so when we pray that God's will be done, that's what we're praying for. That people come into the kingdom. But it is also a prayer for his righteousness and justice to be brought to this fallen world. I don't know about you, but everything I see right now is showing me that God's will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean... Think about all the exploitation, all the abuse, all the manipulation, all the oppression that is happening in this world. You have the powerful taking, care, taking advantage of the powerless. And it ought to cause our hearts to long for that day when, when God's will will be done on earth. And it ought to drive us to our knees begging God to bring his righteousness and justice here now. We should want to see that happen. We should not be content with seeing injustice proliferate throughout this world. So there's the here and now, but there's an already but not yet aspect to this prayer as well. We long for his will to be done now, but our prayer should also have in mind that day that is coming when the consummation of the kingdom will occur at Christ's return at the end of history. That's what we're looking forward to. We pray for that. We pray for that time when there will be universal obedience to God's law. That when people will bow their knee to him and call him Lord. And, and, and we're longing for that. When we see the Sermon on the Mount lived out perfectly. At that moment, God's will of desire will be universal according to God's will of decree. Think about that. God's will of desire will be universal according to God's will of decree. That's what we'll see. You know, there, there's so much in this world that can discourage us, isn't there? I, I read stories every day about people being trafficked for horrible purposes right here in our own backyard. I, I read stories about people being abused in horrible ways. We've seen the stories lately of what can only be described as the wholesale slaughter of babies in the womb being advocated by our governments. And I read stories about how so-called ministers and church volunteers have abused children and others under the authority of the church while others have turned a blind eye or worse, covered it up. Let me tell you something. If it weren't for the promise that God's will will be done, I'd be despondent. Because if it's not for God's will, what hope is there? Are you going to find hope in the government? Are you going to find hope in the, in the private sector? Listen, it doesn't matter if you're pro-government, pro-libertarian, whatever. It doesn't matter. You're not going to find help in any of those places. Are you going to find help in the goodwill of man? Hope comes through the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus. 
That's it. That is the only hope we have. There is hope nowhere else. And when we pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's a reminder of the promise that God's will will be done, that nothing will thwart it. And it fills our hearts with hope that this world and the things of this world are even now passing away. So there's a second aspect of praying for God's will to be done, though, and that is that God's will would be done in us. In other words, it's a prayer that our lives are, are being lived in greater obedience to God's will of desire, that revealed will that we have here. Now, I'll be honest, I suspect, look, we've all grown up probably saying the Lord's Prayer, right? The model prayer. And, and we've all said this how many times? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We've said this over and over. You know, I, I suspect that if most people fully understood what that meant, that his will is being done in us, they choke on those words. Because they don't want to give up their autonomy. They don't want to give up their life. They don't want to submit in obedience to God. That's the reason why Martin Luther called this a fearful prayer. It's a fearful prayer. So it is not wrong to say that we are not truly praying until every request that we make in our prayers is subjected to this one. Did you hear me, church? You're not praying if your petitions are not subject to your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To truly pray that is to surrender our wills to his will, both his will of decree and his will of desire. It's to accept his direction of the events of this world as well as his kingly right to establish the law by which we have been called to live. Now listen, I'm not talking about living under the Mosaic law. Jesus fulfilled that. Paul says we're under the law of Christ. But what's the law of Christ? How's that? Well, I think Jesus sums up what, what the law of Christ is when they asked him, Lord, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus then goes on to say all of the law and the prophets hangs on these two commands. Everything that you find in God's revealed will in Scripture can be put into one of two categories. Love the Lord your God or love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. One of two categories. Doesn't matter. It's going to fit in one of those two. So, so when we truly live these out, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself, when you're truly living those out, you are fulfilling what God requires of us. You are fulfilling his revealed will for your life. That's, what, that's why when we pray this, it means surrendering ourselves to him and his will. But the only way we can make any movement towards either one of those is by surrendering our will, just as Jesus taught his disciples in Matthew 16, 24. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I want you to think about that for just a moment because Jesus said, take up your cross. Remember who he was talking to. He was talking to first century Jews who were living under Roman occupation, who used the cross as the means of crucifixion and execution for the most horrible people in society. That would be like Jesus saying to us today, take up your electric chair and follow me. I want you to get the punch of Jesus' words here. He's saying, deny yourself. Crucify your flesh. Surrender your desire. And follow me. That's why Paul would write in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
And the life, now, the, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I've been around the church long enough to know that there are plenty of saints who pray your will be done as it is, uh, on earth as it is in heaven through some clenched teeth and a set jaw because they don't want to surrender their will to Jesus, but I'll do it begrudgingly because I know that's what you require, Lord. So what does it mean here when Jesus says on earth as it is in heaven? What does that mean? It means simply with joy and gladness. Let me, let me give you a picture in your head. Think about this. In heaven, the angels carry out God's will, right? The angels do what God tells them to do. If he gives them a message and says, go take this message to this teenage girl in Judea, the angels do it. Do the angels ever get mad that God gave them a job to do? Do the angels go, well, why'd you give me that job, God? I don't know why you're... No, they don't grumble. They don't complain. When God's will is done in heaven, it is done with joy, and it is done with gladness, and it is done willingly. They're ready to do it. Even if the angels don't fully understand. And we know that there are things that the angels don't fully understand. They're not God, first of all, right? So they don't have omniscience. They don't know everything. But Peter tells us that the angels long to understand our salvation. They don't get it. Yet, the angels rejoice whenever God's will is done and someone is brought into the kingdom through belief and faith in the Son. You see, when God's will is done, it's to be done joyfully and gladly. But when we're forced to surrender our wills, we often do so begrudgingly. And that's this aspect of the model prayer. It's designed to remind us that in heaven, God's will is not done that way. God's will is done with joy and gladness. What a beautiful testimony to the perfect goodness of our loving and gracious Father in heaven when we can pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven with joyous and enthusiastic hearts, no matter what it is that God has called us to do. When you pray that joyfully, it is a testimony of God's goodness. So how can we do this? We begin to pray this prayer with a joyful heart of submission by remembering that our obedience to the Father's commands comes out of our love for him. 1 John 4.19 says the reason we're able to love in the first place is because he first loved us. We know that the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, while we were God's enemies, Christ died for us. He lived this out. He laid down his life, not just for his friends, not just for people he liked, but for people who were in rebellion against him. Cosmic treason. And Jesus laid down his life. So we see the love of the Father for us. We experience it in his providence. We see it in the gifts of grace that he pours out on us. So how do we demonstrate our love for him? Well, Jesus tells us in John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And listen, Jesus says, look, take my yoke upon you. It is not burdensome. It is not heavy. The yoke of Jesus is light. Following the law of Christ. I'm not saying it's, it's easy because you still wrestle with the flesh. But I assure you it is so much easier than trying to keep the law. You can't keep the law. It's impossible. But God gives you the ability to keep the law of Christ. And so when we resist his will, it actually reveals our rebellious hearts 
that are filled with a love of self, not a love of God. So the first thing is love the Father. Second, it would be the height of foolishness to suppose that we might know God's will if we refuse to spend any time in God's revealed word. Listen, you can't know God's will if you're not here, if you're not in this. And I'm not surprised to know that there are so many believers today who say they don't understand and don't know God's will because biblical illiteracy in the church is staggeringly high. People don't know the Word of God. And if you don't know the Word of God, how can you know His will? How can you know it? We have 66 books of Scripture. And in those 66 books, God has revealed his will for us. There is nothing that he wants you to know, and that includes the direction for your life that is not found right here. Did you hear me? There is nothing that he wants you to know that he has not revealed already to you. But what's happened, church is we've turned away from looking for God's will where he has revealed it, and we instead seek to discover his hidden will by all sorts of other means. We're so worried about what's coming down the road that we're missing the here and now. And what his will for us today is. You know, when we focus our attention on trying to discern some kind of hidden personal will of direction, we're essentially saying that we don't believe that God's word is sufficient for us. If God has revealed everything he wants us to know here in his word, and we say, but that's not enough. That's not enough. And what I need is a personal word of revelation. I need God to somehow speak to me in an audible way to show me where I need to go. We're saying that his word's not sufficient. That's not true. Listen, if you want to hear God speak, you've heard me say this before, read the Bible. And if you want to hear God speak out loud, read it out loud. That's how God speaks, folks, right here. When you're praying and God brings things to mind, what does he bring to mind? His word. Listen, sometimes we think about, well, you know, should I help this person or help that person? Yes, you should help that person. <laughs> yes. Why? Parable of the Good Samaritan, right? We help those who are in need. That's what we do. That's not some magical new revelation from God. That's his spirit bringing to mind the things that he has already taught us in his word. Look, I truly believe that if we would spend as much time studying his word as we do attempting to listen for that personal extra biblical revelation, I guarantee you we would all have a much better grasp of God's will than we do today. That's it. Now finally, as our love for God grows, as our love for the Father grows, and, and listen, the more you study the word, the more you are in God's word, the more your love of God will grow. You can't not, because you will see his beauty and his majesty and his grace and his love and his justice and his holiness on every page of Scripture. And as you study that more and more, you will love him more and more. And as you do that, you will find joy in his fulfilled will. When you see God moving, you're going to rejoice you're going to rejoice when you see God changing our lives into more, into more and more willing and, and unconditional obedience to his commands. We're going to be filled with joy. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. There is no greater joy in the believer's life than to be doing the revealed will of God. There's nothing greater than to do what God has shown us that we are to do. When we're growing in our obedience to him and his commands... When we're loving him and loving our neighbor, we're going to be filled with a joy that is indescribable because we'll experience a greater and closer relationship with the Father through the Son. Oh, praise God. Praise God. So this morning, if you're a believer, I ask you, make a commitment this morning to deny yourself and pick up your cross daily in order to follow him. Surrender your will to his will. 
I assure you there's nothing better you can do in this life. But if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, he's not the Lord and Savior of your life. I want you to be crystal clear about something. The will of God is expressed in Scripture. He offers salvation. But he only offers salvation one way, through Jesus Christ. It is the only name under heaven by which people may be saved. That's it. No other way. And some of you may say, well, again, oh, God is so, so narrow-minded. He only provided us one way to salvation. Listen, it is his grace that provided you one way. It is by his grace that we even have a way. Praise God that he gave us Jesus. Amen. Praise God for that. So this morning, as we sing our final song, I'm going to be right down here at the front. I invite you to come down and talk to me. Believer, if you want to talk about committing to following him, to denying yourself and picking up your cross and surrendering your, your, your will to his will, come down. I'll pray with you. If you want to talk more about who Jesus is and, and what it means to put your faith in him, come down and talk to me. I want to introduce you to him. And so this morning, the praise team is going to lead us in singing, I surrender all. I want you to make very close observation of those words because Jesus doesn't say I surrender, surrender one tenth, surrender half, surrender all. Let's pray. Gracious father. Thank you. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. I, I praise you, Lord, that you are a gracious God that has provided a way of salvation to us through your son. You didn't have to. Your holiness and justice would have been satisfied in the destruction of us. That's what we deserve. The wages of sin is death. But Father, in your grace, in your grace, you've provided us the way out, the way of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray for those of us who know that eternal life, but who are still struggling to follow our own will, to follow our own desires. Father, help us. Give us the strength to crucify our flesh every day and pick up our cross and follow you, no matter where you lead. Help us to be able to sing with sincerity that song that we played during the offertory, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. And Father, for those who don't know him this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit was working even now in their, in their hearts, that you are drawing them to yourself. And Father, that they would not be able to leave this place this morning until they have asked somebody, what must I do to be saved? And Father, we know that when your will is done, all of heaven rejoices. Father, may it be so here on earth as well. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.